Uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming back to me so quickly and uh, yeah. for, for agreeing to take the time to have a chat. Much appreciated. Yeah. Happy to do it. Um, yeah, so I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the, the spiel. Um, as I said in my email, um, myself and a colleague are currently working on a book on, on conspiracy theories uh, more broadly. So that's where, that's where we're coming from. I'm not, I'm not a flat earth believer. But I very much don't want to misrepresent you or, or you know, or, I, or the movement in any way. And I, I most curious. of my interviews, the people do not believe. They're just curious. Um, so. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I've, I've, I've watched the Netflix documentary and a couple of clips of you being interviewed. And you, you seem like a nice guy. I kind of wanted to do the right thing by you and be honest about where I'm coming from. Sure, 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 yeah. sure. No, you can, you can, again, you can ask. There's nothing off limits. You can ask anything you want. And uh, I do not get offended easily. How's that? Okay, fantastic. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing I'm curious about is, I mean, what got you? What got you into this? How did this become your your big thing? Uh, well, a lot of it was from the. I mean, you're you're going to hear some quotes from the um, the documentary, okay. which is which was conspiracy boredom. I mean, I got into conspiracies because I grew up on an island in the northwest corner of the United States, and I was very sheltered, very naive, and didn't believe in any conspiracies at all when, when I went to university. Uh, I mean, when, and it, I mean, I didn't even know there was more than one religion, to be honest. <laughs> not, not seriously. It's like, oh, it, it, like it's an old Simpson jokes. It's like... Um, uh, christian something in miscellaneous you know it's like it's a kindu there are 700 million of us now there's like a billion um and then it, so i got i i my first conspiracy thing that i ever looked at was jfk oliver stone's movie from uh, yeah. uh, from the early 90s and then i mean i walked out of the theater going holy and this is before the internet thinking wow people actually do lie about big things and then i and then so the, the, the JFK film, have you seen it recently? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I watch it every couple of years just, uh, you know, just because I think it's it's going to go down as his opus. You know, it's going to be his, you know, I don't think he made anything better, to, to be honest. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing piece of film. I mean, I, mean, I when I, I saw it as a teenager and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I rewatched it a couple of months ago as part of the sort of research for this book, and it didn't it didn't quit, click quite as well. And I don't know if that's just because I got old and cynical. Now. Well, think of it this way, though. Think of what he did. He interspliced real footage with his footage and turned it into and and again, which is why, like over in the states here, we have laws against that now, because you know for pushing almost three hours you didn't know where his footage ended and he blurred the lines between his stuff and, you know, the actual newsreel stuff. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so I, I, I watched that. And then uh, when the internet fired up and it was new, you know, conspiracies slowly but surely crept up on the internet. And I had, uh, and I never got married or had kids. And I had a lot, a lot of free time on my hands. And had just about an opinion on every, every any conspiracy you can think of. I've got an, an opinion on it. And but I didn't look at flat Earth. Why would I? It's stupid. <laughs> and then I made the mistake. It's like ah, I'm not getting any younger. I might as well look at this damn thing. And just I'm staring at this thing, going, "Why can't I solve this Con entirely to my satisfaction? Why can't I solve this?" And then nine months later. I gave up and I said, well, the internet as a hive mind is very, very intelligent. You know, people miss nothing. It's why, you know, you have moviemistakes.com and stuff like that. You know, if there's, if there's something in film, I love it in film, you know, any production mistake at all, the internet will see it. They, they, you know, somebody will see it at 3 a.m. in the morning in their underwear. And that's what I, I did. I, I put it, put this thing out there. I said, okay, look, here's my best arguments. I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. Internet show me where I'm wrong and shoved it out there and gave all my contact information. It's still, my contact information is still out there today, obviously. And no one came back at me. That's what I was, I was waiting, right? Holding my breath and waiting for some academic to say, okay, here's where you screw it up. Of course, they don't even talk in that accent. They would talk British probably. <laughs> and they, they, nobody did. And then I had subject matter experts calling me up, military people and, and pilots and air traffic controllers and all these people that are dealt with transportation. They said, you know what? It's not that crazy. Here's why. And there's a lot of stuff in the documentary. You know, we shot for seven months. 
And there's a lot they left out. They did not want to give this thing any more credibility than, than need be. And they hated us by the end. I mean, the, I will say this. It, it kind of played into our favor because it made the audience feel safe, even the title, Behind the Curve. But they, they hated us mostly because of, you probably didn't know this, um, at the end of the movie, towards the end of the movie, when we were at the conference and that 12-year-old kid walked up to the microphone and, he's, and he was asking me questions, I didn't even know that this bothered them. I had to listen to the iTunes director's commentary. And when I listened to it, they said, yeah, this is when we had to take a stand right here. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, I hung out with these guys for seven months. They ne mentioned nothing of that. And so, but the thing was, the movie was already basically in the can. They weren't going to reshoot it. So they had to do it in editing and they tortured whoever they could in editing. And it's like, all right, it's fine. But so I, when you said they, they said they had to take a stand. What was that in reference? To um, because yeah. you've heard the saying, it's all fun and games until the kids are involved. Sure. Yeah, yeah. In, my, in, my, in fact, they might as well have been wearing a t-shirt that's saying, for the children. It's like, oh, you're, you're messing with your, you know, it's all flat earth, that's fine. But when you start exposing kids to it, that's when it becomes dangerous. It's like, okay, sure, I guess. But it's not like we drug this kid in there. His parents were standing right behind him. And mm -hmm. I didn't force him to go up to the microphone. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what strikes me is even if there is like a duty of care question around that. That's surely for the parents rather than you guys, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but they didn't, they weren't having it. So they decided, again, it was supposed to be, initially it was supposed to be just a human interest piece. It's all it was supposed to be. And, but in doing that, in taking their stance against it, and nobody in the production of this movie was for it. Nobody. N nor are they now. The director and I have never spoken since we rapped on it. And it was really weird. I mean, he could tell it was just bothering him to, to no end. And it did extremely well in the in the uh, the film festivals. You know, they didn't even think, you know, full well, I mean, most movies, 99% of all movies made are never, ever seen by the general public because they just can't get distribution. Mm -hmm. And there was a perfect example would be like the Toronto Film Festival where it opened. Um, there were 3,000 submissions. They had to pick 100. And out of those, you know, who, who makes the top 10 and out of those who gets bought, nobody had any faith that this thing was going to get picked up. And it was picked up by everybody and every, every film festival. We could, they couldn't even get people reps out to the film festivals fast enough. They sent me. <laughs> That's how bad it got. And they were like, they were watching. They made sure they had live streams watching me on stage talking about this so that I didn't say something out of turn. And they were regretting, you know, it's like, oh, please don't send Mark. Please don't send Mark. So anyway, where was the, what was the original question? <laughs> I, I don't know. We just, we just got lost in chatting, which is really a good sign. Um, but yeah, I was curious as how you were talking about how you were trying to disprove Flat Earth and you found your yeah. what flipped you around. Yeah. What were the arguments for Flat Earth that you found, I mean, or, or, or the arguments against the globe? Which well, you, well, that what was, what was the, the stuff there that really got. The, the big five that are now, it's somewhat changed since I did the clues. Like the, the five big ones that we, you know, we've got all sorts of videos on this um, and playlists. Because we've been, you know, the clues, by the way, are six years old as of next week, which is mind blowing to me because it seems like so long ago. Um, but when you're in flat earth, it's kind of like dog years. The, um, the, the five big, big bullet points that I've been throwing at people for the last three years were, um, uh, one second, the gravity versus the atmosphere of space. That's the big one, one of the big ones. Long distance photography has got to be far and away, though, the most common. Um, so long distance photography, you can see farther than you should be able to. HD technology has changed it. You can see stuff in the distance that you, sh you couldn't see 15, 20 years ago because of HD technology. Gravity versus the vacuum of space, um, vacuum wins over gravity all the time. I mean, every time. So why is our atmosphere still here, which we can get into if you want. Um, the moon shadow during an eclipse is too small. It's only 70 miles wide, the, the blackout zone. And we say that's about what the size of the moon is, even though the moon's supposedly 2,000 miles wide. Um, the moon temperature is cold. The moon is giving off a cold laser light, which you can measure with a point-and-click $20 thermometer, which I probably even have around here somewhere. 
and uh, the Van Allen radiation belts, which is, are they deadly or not? And if they did, how the Americans get through them without any shielding whatsoever? And nobody got radiation poisoning. There's still five of these guys limping around today. Those are the five bullet points I throw at people now. And I've been doing for the last three years. When I started, it was all kind of connect the dot circumstantial stuff because I was treating it like a court of law. Um, the big turning point for me was Antarctica. Uh, which again, they didn't talk about too much in the, in the movie, which was uh, the Antarctic Treaty, which a lot of people don't know. Antarctica is locked down. It, nobody, nobody goes, besides military and military scientists, it's been locked down since 1959 and no corporation, here's where it gets weird. No corporation, no matter how much money, no how, matter how influential your country is, can set up shop there ever. And it's the only treaty in the history of treaties that's bulletproof. It cannot, it's not even up for review until 2041. And that was, a, you know, if you know history and conspiracies, I mean, that just screams red flag because our world is based on money and greed and power. And, yeah. and it is the root of most problems. And especially in the United States, if we want to start fracking in your backyard, <laughs> we can make that happen really, really quickly, right? And yet these same companies with gobs and gobs of liquid assets, can't even not only here's here's the big kicker not only are they not allowed to set up in antarctica they're not allowed to talk about it that's the part that blows me away i mean i'm, I'm going to come on to like one one of the one of those five bullet points that i i have been having difficulty coming up with a counter argument to which is freaking out i'm going to be honest what um I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute but on the antarctic one is that not just it's the opposite of mutually assured destruction isn't it like it's if the US wanted to exploit Antarctica in, in 1959, then it wouldn't have been able to stop the USSR doing that. And the result would have been a great big war. So it was sort of in everyone's interest to just say, okay, this is off limits. No, 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 think, think, that not think, more, think more basic, think corporate. So let's say, yeah, it's a good argument, which is let's say the United States, it's like, well, the thing is everybody was already down there simultaneously. There were like nine countries down there when this whole thing just went out to hell. So if the United States decides, you know, because Russia was rebuilding from the, from the World War, sorry, Soviet Union, um, and the United States wants to exploit it, they've got to let their own private companies come in. Eh, that's a problem, though, because if you let the private companies go in, what you don't want, and this is why the whole thing was locked down, is eventually you're going to have some plane that's going to go off course, and that's easy to do in a, in a very snowy environment, or a helicopter that's going to go off course, and it's going to go into a place where you don't want it to go, and you're going to have to tie up that loose end. And you're going over the procedures and protocols, and you're going, oh, how many of these we're going to have to deal with? I mean, what do we do with these people? What, how, how do we cover this up? And then finally, whoever, you know, the running the show is, says, you know what, let's not even bother. Let's just forget about the money. Just, just lock it down. It's, it's, it's not worth the hassle to do it. It's sort of like, um, and I think I could dump this into chat for you real fast. One second. Um, that should be real. Well, yeah. Uh, give me one sec. I think we've got a chat here, don't we? We should have. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. I'll dump it into chat. You'll see it as soon as I, as soon as I do it. It's sort of like this. And I'm sorry, my video will screw up for one second while it does this. One sec. Okay, so that's just a, a, a straight up shot from Apollo um, 12 in 1969, right? And the, you'll see what I mean in the argument real quick, which is how, how do you deal with the stars if everything's time and date stamped? Because if the belt of Orion is not in the right place and, and, and you know, and some nerd figures this out, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait, this is also in the wrong place. And this is also in the wrong place. It's too much hassle. You can't get the constellations straight in 1969. So you throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's like, you know what? No stars. We're not going to show any stars in anything ever because, and that'll, that'll solve it. And then you just make sure the astronauts are on the same page. It's like, no, no, there's no stars. So when Neil Armstrong was saying, well, I don't really remember. And then everyone was like, shut up, shut up. Anyway, so yes, and Antarctica, you can't, the, the corporate interests, you can't, you can't let it, I look, I would, I'm, when it comes to conspiracies, I'm a little different than most people in that I justify a conspiracy based on what I would do if I was in their shoes. Meaning I put myself in the others, I put myself in the black hat and I say, would I do anything different or could I do it better? And honestly, everything they did with Antarctica was perfect. 
That's exactly what you should do. You lock it down. You make it as restricted as possible. You make sure nobody owns it. Again, I, it was talked about in the clues, but not in the, uh, the documentary. Find me a piece of real estate in the world that's not owned by anybody. Uh, how does that happen? Everybody owns the, the, you know, everyone's fighting over real estate. And in this case, no one owns it. And then we're talking a huge chunk of real estate. Okay, I, there is there is a chunk of uh, land in in East Africa that isn't claimed by any state. Did you know this one? No. Um, this and is, you're, you're uh, the first one to mention this. There's a, there's a part of Africa that's not real. How oh, is it? I will, after we yeah after we will send you an email with full details. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the something triangle. Um, the reason for this is it's it's uh, on the border between uh, I think it's Egypt and Sudan. I think. Um, but it's it's a disputed border, and there's like one border, one possible border goes like that, and one possible border goes like that. Oh, there's okay, of, okay. There's a chunk of land that both countries claim because it has oil resources. I got it. So neither of them claim the, this other one because if they if that is theirs, then this is not. Does that make sense? I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to say, yeah, look, there's free. a there's it's a, a tiny mess. sliver. I I get that because I I know property lines pretty well. And you're absolutely right. If they if in the old days, if it's drawn a certain way, yeah, uh, you're going to have this weird incongruity where yeah that yeah yeah yeah, yeah I got it. But, but yeah, no, I, I, just, I just thought it was interesting. I thought you might be interested. No, thank you. Um, no, that, thank you. You were the first person in, in six years to, to bring that up. And the I, fact I, that you I, know I will, this. I will send you a link. Um, yeah, look, what, one of your arguments that's, uh, that, that's freaking me out a little bit, I have to say, yeah. is the long distance photography one, because I've not yet found the, the counter argument there. Oh, so. my God. Have you seen, there's a video that I put on my channel. It's in the, um, it's in the playlist called uh, Experiments, I believe. And the first one I put at the top of the list is um, some oil rigs off of California, one at six miles and one at 10 miles. And the reason why I love it so much, uh, in fact, I was just watching it before I came on with you, is because they're static objects. They're not boats. They're bolted into the, into the floor. And so they're not going to move on a, on a day-to-day basis. And what's amazing is when you look, and you know, California weather is pretty good. When you look out there, not only are, are neither of them hidden by curvature, that's not the part that, that throws people. And I, 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 the trolls have a really tough time with this. It's that the horizon's behind both of them. Well, that can't happen. The horizon can't be in front and behind them at the same time. Meaning, you know, if, if they're slightly on the other side of the curve because of the curvature of the earth, okay, then it should be hidden. You know, part of it should be hidden. Okay, then what's that behind them? And it's behind both of them. And it's, it's a great shot. Uh, and, and it's not even a still shot. It's, it's movies that you can go down there any day off of Santa Barbara and, and take these shots. It's, it's wonderful stuff. So yeah, long distance photography. And I didn't come up with it, by the way. It was not in the clues. When the clues came out, I don't know why people did this. People just started running to the beaches with HD cameras and started shooting stuff off in the distance. Where, by the way, the documentary just stayed away from that. Even though this team was from Los Angeles, they absolutely stayed away from this entirely. And uh, anyway. I mean, they clearly, they, they came with an agenda. That's pretty... Well, I mean, I get it, but, but again, it worked out because in the end, because I sat in some of these film festivals, the audience felt safe, meaning they went in, it's like, oh, we're going to make fun of flat earth or blah, blah, blah. and that's exactly what happened, you know, and, and so, and so what, to use a drug reference, it wasn't pure uncut flat earth. It was flat earth, flat earth, scientist, flat earth, flat earth, psychiatrist, flat earth, flat earth, astronaut. Right. And, you, and I felt this when I was in the audience. So there's people who's like, okay, I'm getting freaked out. Okay. Thank God there's a scientist on here. I'm, I'm safe now. Uh, there's more flatter. You know, it was this weird up and down. But by the time they got, you know, 100 minutes later, they were totally engaged. And as any producer will tell you, it doesn't matter whether you love or you hate a topic as long as you're looking at it. So I, I wouldn't, I would barely change anything. Even the sting at the end where they went after Jaron with the laser experiment, even that played well with the audience it made them feel safe going out it's like oh, okay they probably made a mistake here you know the, you know i can i can go away i'm not going to freak out but there was you know a lot of people that were looking it up when they got home so couldn't you, I, how, have an interest how do you explain that experiment oh he didn't have line of sight it was totally jaron's fault it's, oh my god so they did the experiment twice that's the part and remember this was in a shoestring budget these guys were like maxing out credit cards to get this this movie done 
And the first time that the laser condenser melted, people don't know that if you use a military grade laser, um, the, the beam, well, if you don't use them, if you use just like it, you buy a laser pointer at a drugstore, the, the beam spreads two feet per mile. It, you know, just starts spreading and spreading to where even at four miles, you're talking about a, a massive, you know, that's why you see it this big, it's not a, it's not a little dot anymore, but if you use a military laser, it gets really, really hot. So the first test they did, they melted the condenser. It was just blown because you're not supposed to leave the laser on. It's meant to target things and shoot things. You're not supposed to like just leave it on them for a while. But the second one, he never had line of sight. And by that, I mean, again, totally Jaron's fault. I don't give him too much crap though, because eh, it happens. You learn as you go along. And meaning he, you, you know what the saying is? Never, ever do the first test live. You know, you, you, know, that's yeah. why you do dry runs. He got so much grief that all of a sudden he did a, a video later where he went out during the daytime. You know, he went out to the site during the daytime. He goes, well, this is the first time me checking out. And it's like, what do you mean it's the first time? You, you never went to the site <laughs> before you brought the film team? You just, he just thought it was a flat piece of land. It was absolutely hilly. It was all sorts of this obstructions and stuff. And he said, well, on Google Earth, it looked flat. You know, it looked like I had line of sight. It's like, Isn't that it's famously 2D? It's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I know. And, and it's like, and, and he, honest to God, he didn't check this out until months after the documentary came out. Months. And it's like, dude. It's like, so, but now he knows. I mean, he was the first one to say, look, if you're ever going to do anything with the film team, do it on your own first before you bring a freaking team out there. And it's, it's the old saying, it's like, well, what? It's live. What could go wrong? And so, yeah. Uh, so, no, he didn't have line of sight, which is why he should have used a body of water, which is what, again, but to his defense, the film team knew full well about all these other experiments we had done. Heck, we had just gone to Hungary and shot across uh, Lake Balaton at 40 kilometers. We had Guinness Book of World Records there with us shooting. You know, for, you know half of our people died of pneumonia. That's no, not true. But, but they shot 40 kilometers across this frozen lake and nailed it, absolutely crushed it. Film team didn't want to see that. Film team only wanted to see things, you know, that, that made them look in a, in a good light. I mean, for God's sake, the fact that they got Scott Kelly, one of our astronauts, was just mind-blowing to us. They couldn't even figure it out. They said, oh, yeah. He said yes right away. He came on. He said, I, I only want to talk for five minutes. He knew exactly what he was going to say. And they used that for the trailer. The, the sound bite was perfect, which was, the first time I heard about Flat Earth, I was in space. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> And that trailer brought in people because they felt safe. I said, like, well, the astronaut obviously knows better. Lord knows the United States government and military would never lie about anything, ever. Can I ask how, uh, how international is the movie? I mean, obviously, the, the you know, behind the curve focuses very much on, on Americans. But uh, uh, how, I mean, presumably it's not just a, a US. Oh, movie. no, no, no. We did very well. Um, in fact, uh, I did in 2019, before this whole 2020 madness happened, um, I did speaking things. I did conferences in seven countries. In fact, I was over in your neck of the woods. I did, um, uh, I did a conference in London and then I did speaking things in Ireland, uh, Belfast and Wales. And I uh, even made it, I even came back and did the uh, Philip and Holly show. Uh, yeah, no, I've seen that clip. Yeah. yeah, and then we did. I, I went over to Stockholm, did the Gather Festival, opened that, did a conference in New Zealand, did a um, television commercial for a mobile company in Melbourne, of all things. That was weird. Um, did a couple things in Canada. And it's, so, but as far as the Flat Earth communities in non English speaking countries, you want to see some weird stuff, type in Flat Earth, convert it to another language. And then plug that plug that word back into Google. They're everywhere. In fact, I've got a video um, with not is just focusing on non English countries. Uh, you know, different little videos because we only you know over in the United States because we only care about English. We, I mean, there's tons of them. They're all over the place, depending on what country it is. I mean, but I there's really nowhere we haven't gone into. Yeah, are there some countries where it's bigger than others? Yeah, yeah. South America is really big on it. Australia, not as much. New Zealand, not as much. Um, uh, Britain, really big. Uh, some parts of Europe, I'm trying to think though. Some, some parts of Asia, 
Russia is pretty big. Uh, what was the biggest country? Um, the, the biggest surprising country, and they were on board almost immediately of all of it was Estonia. We made a ma- we made yeah we made the cover of some Estonia magazine like immediately, like, like back in, back in twenty end of twenty fifteen beginning of twenty sixteen, blow, blow blew my mind. And then over here, you know, we did oh here I mean stuff. I'll, I'll throw stuff in here for you really fast. Um, like we made like in twenty nineteen we made the cover of Popular Science, Newsweek. Skeptic, and we did all, all that in a really short amount of time. I mean, there was nobody because it's an interesting, interesting topic, and it's non-threatening from a conspiracy standpoint. Meaning, out of all the conspiracies, it's real. It's got a real positive message to it. It's not. This, it's not. No offense. I mean, you know conspiracies as well as anybody. It's not. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not as black hat as the others. Meaning it, the United the government never built this place. So what uh, if they didn't build it, all we're doing is keeping the secret. And if it's got a message of hope built into it, I mean, that's why there's way more women in this than other conspiracies. Surprising amount of women. Can I ask, um, who do you think is, I, I don't quite understand like who is meant to be behind this deception. I mean, firstly, is why, it keep, why keep it a secret? Wrong? Yeah. Okay, think, of, think if, about if, this. If, if you are right and the received wisdom is wrong, right. who is behind this and what are they trying to gain? Got it. It's not what they're trying to gain, just, you know, to, to preface it. It is what they stand to lose. So if you don't know, if you built civilization, if you're the powers that be, and by that, um, the first rule of power is stay hidden. You know, never put yourself in a position to be overthrown is the curse and the blessing of being the puppet master in that if you're the puppet master, you can't let anyone know who you are because they will find you. Um, so, you know, kings and, and um, uh, all sorts of royalty and presidents and dictators, they can be overthrown because you know who they are. So let's say some of these people with bank accounts, they, they don't even care about money. And, and if you want to say people like the Rothschilds or the Bilderbergs are fine. It's old money. It's not Bezos and Gates and those guys. You know, it's, it's old, old money. Um, if you have your civilization pretty much built, but you don't, aren't completely sure on, on what exactly the world is, and you don't even have the ability to figure it out until almost 1960, do you tell anybody? Probably not. Here's why. Um, the, the ripples, the ramifications. Remember, what I have learned over the years is people in power don't take chances. Kind of like organized crime. You, you've seen the crime movies where it's like, if they're even, the, what, what's that great De Niro line? If there's ever a doubt, there is no doubt. Meaning, if you even suspect, even like if there's a 5% chance that who, that guy over there is a rat, he's gone. <laughs> He's gone. You know, they may put it to a vote, but, you know, unless it's vetoed by somebody. So if you tell the population in 1960, right, what's happening, here's what might happen. Academically, every university in the world has to rebuild their science programs. And we're talking about a lot of science programs from the ground up. Uh, first of all, um, astronomy and astrophysics, those things are gone until you can figure out what to do with them. And then the remaining ones, biology, geology, hydrology, archaeology, anything with anology, has to be literally rebuilt. And that is just huge academic upheaval. That's just academics. Economically, you would have to suspend world markets for months just to figure out what it all means, what the ramifications are, what industries will change. Um, but the big one would be the religious side of it. I mean, think about it. eight out of every 10 people is tied to some religion in one way or another, um, be it um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the five big religious houses. You're giving all them, all these five houses re- leverage against science simultaneously. And you're telling them to show restraint. Probably not going to happen because, you know, they've been beaten over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries, at least. And you're telling them, you know, because it would never stop. It's like, okay, so you were wrong about this. What else are you wrong about? Let's revisit evolution and the Big Bang Theory and dark matter and carbon dating and anything else we can think of. They would be, uh, uh, science would be on their heels for decades, if not forever. And so those things I just rattled off, right? So you're in this big, we'll call it the Illuminati meeting, right? The big long table, dark, everyone's smoking. 
and you tell them, and someone says, what's the worst that could happen, right? If we tell people what the world is, and then they rattle this stuff off and it'd be the shortest meeting ever. It'd be like, yeah, we're not gonna tell anybody because you don't, you, if there's even a small percentage that the, the public just does not take that well and everything gets turned upside down, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it until you have a way of introducing it. You're not gonna keep it a secret forever probably, but until you can figure out a way to introduce it to the public where your narrative, it benefits you, you're not, you're not going to do it. And that's why I think it's coming out now. I mean, that's why it's, it's, it's disseminated so quickly. I mean, think of what, what the infrastructure is now in place, high speed internet, um, 6 billion smartphones, social media, you can push out whatever narrative you want. I mean, we've seen that last year, you know, everybody knows, you know, about the virus and, and that, that narrative has been very well put in place in a, in a short amount of time. So does that kind of help? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's really useful. Thank you. <laughs> are there, are there sort of historical movements that you guys look up to, like that you're trying to emulate under the Reformation or something? No, no, we're completely in uncharted territory. We have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> we have no freaking clue. In fact, I had a friend of mine um, who wasn't in the documentary. He was, he was talking to me about how, how polarizing flat earth is, you know, nobody's on the fence about it. You either are in or you're out and it's no one's, I've never seen anyone going, yeah, I could take it or leave it. Um, because you, because of the conditioning and we're even wondering, you know, if we're, and I wouldn't necessarily say this, uh, on, on a, on an inter, on a formal interview, but it's like, you know, is it possible that we are creating some of the polarization through what we're doing? Are we, are we adding to it? And, you know, like the, like some media are saying, oh, fake news is, is going to damage people. And we've got to stop that and come up with a ministry of truth type situation. And, you know, it's it, inadvertently, you know, we are opening minds, but in the process, what happens is when you get into flat earth, you're, you, you now revisit all the other conspiracies. So people are getting into looking at all these other conspiracies backwards now because they got into flat earth. Cause once you get into it, seriously, people are like, yeah, they're, they're reopening books that they, they had closed for a long, long time because why wouldn't they? Because it's like, if you could hide this, if you could keep this a secret, then you could do just about anything. Yeah, that's sort of, to, 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 to be honest with you, that's kind of like why we wanted to get into it in the book, because as you were saying when we were talking about the 12-year-old at the conference, yeah. compared to a lot of the conspiracy theories out there, it's, you know, even, even if people think you guys were a bit cranky, it's harmless, right? It's not. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it is, there's no, it's not like we, when we, when we talk about this, when we do conferences and meetups, it's really a happy gathering mm. and people are really excited and they're talking about stuff. And, you know, we're not talking, you know, we're not talking in whispers about all sorts of dark things, <laughs> you know, talk, talking like, talking like Christian Bale and Batman, like you're gargling marbles. It, it's, it's a very positive thing. And that's what, how it spreads. You know, no, pe people don't like, people tend to avoid negative stuff and your average conspiracy person, you know, tends to, come off as you know anti-government anti this anti that and i get all that i i do i mean don't get me wrong i mean it's look power corrupts but i have always been a believer in it's gonna make me sound horrible the greater good which is again how i qualify things and that is do the ends justify the means we've all done it in a certain things you know some things are better left unsaid what you don't know that won't hurt you that sort of stuff the in and, and as much as people would say, oh, you know, we have the right to know and no one can control us. It's like, yeah, but it tends to work that way anyway. You know, you get people, once you get to a certain level of power, you start taking liberties that maybe you shouldn't, but at the same time, you want to get things done and you don't want the debate. And it's like, yeah, we could ask the, the population about this, or maybe we could just do it because it's going to benefit them anyway. Like, you know, the United States going into the Middle East and taking all the oil or securing as much oil as possible. It's a, that's a perfect example. And that is, look, it, in fact, I, I said this to the, the group in Stockholm. I asked them, you know, I, I said, how much do you pay for gas right now? Right? And they, they gave me whatever the price was. I can't remember it was how much. It was ridiculous, though. And people in the United States don't get it. And I go, yeah, the United States, we pay half that. Yeah, And it's like, do you know why? And they all nodded their heads. Like, yeah, they know why. Because we secured it. We went and we took it. 
And is it an abuse of power? Sure. You know, would there, are there people in the United States that wouldn't do that? Sure. However, are they going to complain, you know, about, about low prices at the gas pump? No. <laughs> anyway. It's also, you've frozen, you're still with me? Okay, you've unfrozen. Okay, cool. It's, it's also, I mean, just on the, on specifically on, on gas prices, I mean, ours are also much higher than you. I don't actually drive. I live in central London, so I've never owned a car. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the reasons ours is so high is because it's taxed so much more. But but you can flip that around and say when there is instability in prices, that doesn't really affect us so much because you know if, if 80% of the price is taxed rather than the actual resource, you're kind of cushioning the blow a little bit. So you can, you know, it, it goes both ways. We we've got a weird thing over here where um, and I can't I'm not gonna convert the leaders because you guys do it per liter and we do it per gallon, where there's some sort of psychological barrier, and I don't know why, but I've seen it for years when gas prices hit four dollars a gallon here and you're saying oh my god four dollars a gallon that's so cheap when it hits four dollars a gallon here people stop spending money on other things they all of a sudden you you can see like a notable noticeable dip in spending and so the united states has has done a remarkable job of keeping the gas prices in the three dollar and change range for a long time and that's they they figured out that is right now that the current max is what they can do i mean there's some places you know they charge more but for the most part they keep keep it under there i don't know why it's weird i don't know what the 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 meaning is of that just just to kind of go back to the the sort of cosmology form yeah, yeah 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 what I, I realize there is there are divisions in the community about these questions but just in your mind what is what is out there? What is beyond Antarctica? What is beneath our feet? What is above our heads? How does the universe work? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, you've seen the, well, that Skeptic magazine cover is about as, as good as it gets, as, with the exception of the white areas not too far. I mean, we're talking about basically a snow globe. You are, you're in a giant uh, building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And again, it was so big that we couldn't even figure it out until about 1960 because we just didn't have the technology. I mean, internal without the internal combustion engine, we'd never find it anyway. But as far as what's outside of it, here, I'll pull out a model that was made for me by some company in Italy, completely unsolicited, by the way, this little baby right here. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's a coin, actually. It's like a two ounce silver coin that, oh, uh, that they made. It's called Power Coin. And they, they, they were doing something called, you're gonna like this, uh, the series is called Great Conspiracies. <laughs> and the very first one they did was Flat Earth. And they made the coin with a dome on it. And again, they didn't even consult me. They just made this thing on their own. It's like, ah, not bad. Not bad at all. So when you, when you go out into Antarctica, eventually uh, you're going to run into some sort of barrier. You know, the edge of the, edge of, uh, the wall. You know, because that's the most common misconception. People think it's just this asteroid floating in space. It's like Asgard in Thor, right? Which it does no favors at all. It's like, where's the cosmic waterfall? No. Um, and then, you know, what's the barrier made out of? Take your pick. I mean, it's a dealer's choice on that one. It's impenetrable, you know, a heavy element, heavy water, high frequency, electromagnetic, unified field, whatever it is. But we can't punch through it with megaton weapons or harp or probably CERN. I don't think they've gotten through it anyway. Uh, what's outside of it? Is that the question? You know, what's what's outside of this universe? Yeah, what do you, what do you imagine is beyond? Oh, I, I, I have little doubt what's outside of it. And I only base it on what it is in here. So if this world is 99.9% .9 conflict, and by that it doesn't matter how rich or powerful or beautiful or talented you are, you always have things to complain about. There's always entropy. There's always strife. You know, the beautiful people are, are slaves to the mirror and they don't, they don't ever want to not be beautiful. If you're into money, you're always thinking about money. Um, uh, talent, talented people think they're going to be accused of being a fraud and so on and so on. You could have a hundred room mansion. You're going to complain about something, you know, the, the staff or the plumbing or whatever it is. You, you always have something to complain about no matter what. And I think that's fascinating. So if that's the case, I think whatever's outside of here is 99% um, unlimited universe. You know, you want to call it heaven, Shambhala, Nirvana, whatever. It doesn't really matter. And I think it's cyclical. I think that we exist in that realm 
but like anything you can only you can only go so long because i think the universe as a whole outside this world and i don't think it's space i don't think it's planets and galaxies and crap like that and it's just basically emptiness uh i think the universe runs on novelty and by that i mean what the thing we always say when we greet each other it's like what's new what's happening you know what what but that's the big thing it's like what's new because we without new things we get stagnant we get bored and we end up going nuts i mean how many people have like tapped out netflix nowadays we've run out of things to watch because no one's making any, anything new we're um, not the lockdown over here so you're talking about it <laughs> yeah oh it's it's awful i mean i'm starting to watch stuff with subtitles and i never used to do that um or do the Danish dramas that have been very big. Have you watched any of them? It's, uh, if you're into if you're into your crime genres, there's some very good stuff coming out. I've, I've heard I've heard some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we'll see. The one anyway. I would most recommend is a thing called The Bridge, which is the Danish Swedish co-production. Oh, cool. Um, but that's that's genuine. I would yeah, that's genuinely worth checking out. It's just kind of like it starts as a crime drama, but the crimes are kind of like it's a crazy James Bond. All right, the bridge. Yeah, yeah. Well, the bridge. I'll check I, it out. So I. I think I think that eventually what happens is in this unlimited universe we run out of ideas. I'll give you the the genie scenario. This will this will make sense, which is um, you you have a genie. You know you rub the lamp, he comes out and he says, "Oh, three wishes," and you're clever and you think, "Oh, one of my wishes is unlimited wishes," and he's like, "All right, fine." So you start wishing for just about everything you can think of. You you become the captain of industry. You become the biggest movie star, biggest rock star, the greatest lover. Blah, blah, blah. You do all these things for a long, 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 long time. It's, it actually was a Twilight Zone based off of this. And he, uh, or you, eventually run out of ideas. And you, you're tapped. I mean, you absolutely run out of ideas. I mean, it's only limited by your imagination. Well, nobody has unlimited imagination. So you go to the genie. It's like, man, I'm, I'm out of ideas. What do I do? He goes, well, I've got something for you. And he, he goes, but you're not going to like it. He goes, what? He goes, well, I got this place you can go to. Limited lifespan, suffering in all corners. You're not going to be able to escape it. It's going to be awful you know, compared to what it is now. But you're not going to be there that long. And when you come out of it, you, uh, you'll appreciate this place a lot more. Like it was brand new. And you say, oh, really? What's the catch? And he goes, the catch is you're not even going to remember this conversation snap and you are there because that's the thing you can't you've the dead metaphor um you can't have your cake and eat it too right you can't be here and remember where you were it's the you know why are we here well it's, that's not the question the question is why can't you remember what you what was before this if you if you're into that and because if you did you'd bail people would bail in two seconds it's like life's hard i want a bridge to jump off of and so you, the, the fear of the unknown is what keeps you here, basically. You don't know there's anything else. And so you're here. And I think it's, I don't think it's a prison planet. I obviously don't think it's pure entertainment. I think it's a school. I think you're here to learn something. And when you're done learning something, you go back and enjoy. You know, I think you spend most of your time over there, but you come here to kind of get a, your perspective back in line. That's really, yeah, okay, that's really, that's an interesting idea. Um, like the thing I find, uh, for once, a bit, like, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a nerd, you can probably tell, I grew up on like, you know, Star Trek and stuff like that. Okay, um, well, wait, wait, before you, before you say that, who's the best, who's your favorite Doctor Who? Oh, uh, Matt Smith. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a proper Doctor Who nerd, actually. That's All right. I just went with the US reference first, but yeah, I'm far more into Doctor Who than Star Trek. Nice. Um, but they, like one of the things I find very frustrating about the, the, the universe as science describes it is that we aren't going to be going to other planets or traveling in time because the rules of the universe do not allow it. And one of the things I wonder if it's part of the appeal of, of the, the, the cosmological model you guys are looking at is what else is out there is just over there. It's not something that we will never reach in a human lifetime. It's it kind of just opens up possibility again. It's yeah, 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 yeah. It. It's, it's kind of like a Stargate uh, slash Expanse slash sort of thing. But, but the, the thing is, it's, it's not that it's inaccessible. It's just that it's hidden. That's what I love about it. It's like, look, every, all the possibilities are right there. But you don't, know, you don't even know it. 
it's not it's not that it's a galaxy so far away and you have to create light travel and all this other crap and spend years in hyperspace the garbage it's right there but the the trick is is that you can't see it and not only that but you're not told that it's even there because of course and that's deliberate because people would want to go there no one would want to be here everyone would bail immediately um you know we've seen this in in simulations that we've made in even in the gaming world where you know this big exodus from one game to another you know because people's like oh that's more fun and people just like leave the realm it's like well you were really excited about this for a while no not anymore <laughs> we're over we're doing this now so um i'm i'm aware how much of your time i've taken up so i should be kind of like drawing things for conclusion just okay a couple of, a, a couple more questions um obviously in the in in you know, the scientific method the big thing is like fortifiability what is there that will convince you that you were wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, a, that's, that's always a fun question. And that's changed over the years um, because I've tried to make it simple. Uh, I've tried to make it reachable for, for people. Um, two things, you know, obviously, someone would say, oh, if they put you into space, <laughs> you're never putting me into space. Uh, even Elon. And people are like trying to push like Elon Musk to, to put me into space or somebody from my community into space, which of course begs the question, why hasn't Brian Cox gone and Neil Tyson and Michio Kaku and those guys? Uh, but the two things are, one, get any sort of 4K camera or whatever kind of camera on some capsule of any rocket that's going to leave orbit, pointed at the ground, pointed at, you know, the ground. And as it's launching, make sure you, you no edits, just let that sucker run. And you should see the Earth form into a globe as, you know, as it leaves. It's never happened in the history of space travel, ever. And that's stunning that, you know, no matter what probe is ever sent, no matter what, what rocket ever goes up, that footage does not exist. Statistically <laughs> impossible. Um, and and I, honestly, the, the, the red Tesla in space, that's what I would have hoped it would have been on because he had three different HD cameras on that freaking car, supposedly. And yet when it's like, okay, we're going to slingshot around the sun and head to Mars, right? And cut broadcast. Why'd you cut it? It's like, oh, the batteries were running low or something. It's like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Why did you just let it run? It was perfect. Because he can. It's the fourth wall. Um, the other one, though, that I throw to people, which is a little dangerous, but eh, no risk, no reward, I guess, is the uh, the vacuum chamber experiment, which is thermodynamics. Uh, you know, pressure can't exist to non-pressure without a barrier, which is why everything in a vacuum chamber blows up into a balloon and then detonates. You can see those videos all day long. And it's not, again, it's not like the movies. It's instant. You know, when you expose something to a vacuum, it's very, very quick and violent. So there's only two things that, that don't follow this rule or law. Uh, one is the, the Earth atmosphere. So how does that even, how does that even work? Why, you know, you have a vacuum of space next to an, a, a, an atmosphere and it, it doesn't rip it off. And I know your initial thing might be, well, it's gravity. I go, okay, fine. Let's do a quick thought experiment. You put a vacuum chamber above you, right? And a valve. You pull that valve, what happens? Well, it's instant, it's violent, and you're probably going to black out. You might even die. Well, the question is, why didn't the gravity in your room keep the air in your room instead of going upstairs? And then you go outside, and you have to ask that question again. And I've even had people come back and say, well, it's because it's more gravity outside. I go, no, it's the same gravity. <laughs> it's literally it's the same freaking gravity. It's not a regional thing. Um, Sorry, back to the vacuum of space. The only thing is, the, and I did a video on this um, called For Want of a Nail um, about the spacesuit, which is the spacesuit is a soft, pliable thing. And why doesn't a spacesuit turn into a football, your football, or a basketball, or a volleyball, or whatever it is? It should expand instantly. There should be no articulation points. Nobody should be able to bend their arms or their knees because the vacuum would just make that thing rigid. It would turn into a parade float. And yet it doesn't. I mean, they're perfectly, they're running around, they're doing complex. I mean, the, the gloves, they can actually do complex electronic stuff with gloves. How, how? Those things should turn into oven mitts. And yet they don't. And so my, my argument is, you know, give me, loan me a spacesuit, put me in a vacuum chamber. And not, not talking about a tethered G-force suit. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, backpack, self-contained spacesuit and tell me how, what happens. Tell me how I, I don't die. And it's, it'd be easy to prove. I mean, there's things you could buy for all of a few pounds that would, um, that could prove it was an actual vacuum. 
And that is never, ever done. In fact, if you type in, it's really interesting. You go to YouTube, you type in man in a vacuum chamber or someone in a vacuum chamber. You know, the first one that shows up is James May. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> okay. Because, because he went out on his own. He went to an American Air Force base and they put him in a G-Force suit, a tethered suit, you know, and put him in a, in a little chamber. And he was scared to death. And they, they, they took, turned it to almost a near vacuum and the suit went completely rigid and he was scared out of his freaking mind. But you, there should be thousands of hours of astronauts in, in vacuum chambers and there's not. They train in swimming pools, which makes no sense because that's the exact opposite. The pressure is coming in from the outside. It's not, it's not from the in moving out. So why, why would you do that? And that challenge has been out there for three years. No one's entertained it. Uh, how does that happen? So yeah, between those two, th one of those two things, between the, the camera on a rocket and a spacesuit would go a long way to convincing me that that was the case. Everything else has, has failed. Um, the long distance photography thing, you know, we put challenges out to the com community. It's like, show me an object. Here's, here's the one. I put this out there for years. No one will touch it. And that is show me an object at 100 miles or less over a body of water that we can't see, that we can't see. A static object. I mean, if you want to say it's a boat or a building or whatever, a lighthouse, I don't really care. But that we can't see under any weather conditions, we can't see it. No, it never happened. And uh, again, they, science people, they have a tough time, tough, tough time with, with some of our arguments. Again, I, I, I know you want to wrap this up, but it's, it comes down to this. Can I prove to you that the earth is flat? No, can't prove it. If I could, I'd, I'd be really famous. Uh, can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that you have nowhere left to turn, but you know, some sort of model like this? Yeah. And do that all day long and say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I don't know what they call it in, in the UK. Um, but it works in our court system here every hour, every day, reasonable doubt. Uh, yeah, we have the same, we have the same yeah. So if that's the case, but sci for scientists, they have a tough time because well, they say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I go, it is for the general public. And that's what we're talking about here. The reason why this has expanded as well as it's done, the reason why we're in magazines and documentaries and I get to go off and do fun things is because we created a model of the universe that's easier to understand than the solar system model. And you, and again, science was well, like, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's right. I go, no, but it means the general public will follow it because the, the, the general public, and use the art of war reference, people are like water. They always take the, the easiest path, the path of least resistance. If flat earth is easier to understand now and makes sense to them, then the solar system model, what do you think they're going to go with? They're going with the flat earth model. And until the solar system, in, which is why science is in this tough spot, because they don't know how to dumb, scientists don't know how to dumb down science. They don't. In fact, it's insulting to them to even ask them. So they, they if you, until you create an easier thing to understand than we've done, we're just going to keep racking up the numbers. Just going to keep getting bigger and weirder. And, and uh, oh yeah, here's one. Sorry. Here's, here's two things for you really fast. Because you asked. Hang on one second. That is a meetup we did in San Francisco. And this is, there, there is a country that, that actually, uh, let's see if it's in there, 24. That's South Korea. <laughs> I didn't get to do that one. The, the black guy in the middle, that's D Marble. He, he got to uh, do South Korea, but yeah, we're pretty big in South Korea too. Didn't even know it. They just called him one. It's like, hey, can we send one of your guys over? We want to do a, a conference. Cool. Okay, excellent. I know. Um, sorry, just one, one, one last question. I'm just really curious. You said you did a TV commercial. Oh yeah, Australia. yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, how's, how's that happen? Right. That was, was it happened because most of our members are in the closet. Ninety percent of our members do not make themselves public, and there were uh, some of our flat Earth members were in the um, the marketing department of a mobile company in. Australia called um oh crap I can't, I can't remember the name of it, it was an yeah, online sports stuff I can check I'm just oh no curious. sports sports bet in fact I'll, I'll send you the commercial if you want it um, yeah, no, I'm just I'm curious like, uh it was called sports it's called sports bet and they were doing a campaign called foolproof and you can probably get where it was going which is well if these guys can use our app then anyone can so they were talking you know using different people and 
they called me up and they and they said, hey, can you can you fly down? We, we want you to, to do a thing for the flat earth. What was interesting though, was when I got there and I was looking at the call sheet, I was the only non-actor in that slip, you know? And it was weird because like three of the things they were trying to like American beauty queens, I was going, it's going, how'd you get like Miss South Carolina? It's like, no mate, <laughs> she, she's Australian. And it's like, what? It's like, all these people are Australian? It's like, yeah, they're all Australian actors. I go, I go why'd you bring me? I go, you could have had somebody pretend to be an American flat earther. And it's like, well, some of the people wanted to meet you. And I got to meet some of these people and they didn't want to be named. They were just, you know, we got this weird hidden population. You, you, I'll, I'll throw one more out here real fast. Um, do you know uh, tennis at all? Uh, not well, though. I mean, I'm aware of it, obviously. Oh, here, I'll show you this real fast. So this was, this is the number one tennis guy in the world. And he did this little thing on Twitter where he was holding up he, again he didn't do a monologue like our basketball guy Ky Kyrie Irving or um oh who's your guy that came out uh Freddie Flintoff <laughs> and he he can with his picture of the flat earth right and was interesting only found this out later is like he didn't draw that his three-year-old daughter drew that and, or no, not three, it was his daughter. And it, then he held it up, but he didn't do any audio about this. So no one gave him any grief. No one figured it out. Now, if he had done a podcast on this, they would have given him all sorts of hell. But we've got all sorts of, of uh, really cool people in the industry, um, it, it just about all sectors, but they, they won't come out. They, they just like, yeah, we don't want it. We don't want the hassle. We're just, they're quiet flat earthers in the background. Yeah, I mean, I can kind of see how just just for a just for an easy life frankly like it's i can imagine how there are people who believe but don't want to make it their identity oh yeah um before uh, you know alex jones didn't do a thing on us until um the end of 2019 or maybe even beginning of 2020 um he his team called in he his team called us called me um beginning of 2016 2017 and they were scared to death of doing a flat earth show scared to death they go how long can we do a show without actually saying the words flat earth they asked me this and i go 10 minutes maybe and i go if i dance around they go yeah we can't take the chance the backlash might be huge and uh and then they held to their round they didn't they didn't do one for another three years so any anything else any other references or little detailed things i think like, that's i think that's good i think that's good um i will I, I know from from my own past history there will almost certainly be something i remember later and send you an email about no worries um, i just sent you the uh one of freddie's covers by the way in case you uh, oh fantastic yeah i'll, I'll download everything as we go so. but there's there's a perfect example he comes out and says it and your papers just skewered him <laughs> you guys just came yeah. at him and yet, you know, real fast, I'll give you one more. Uh, I'll dump in here, which is um, every culture at some point up until about 500 years ago, they all drew the same thing. Kind of reminds me of the Close Encounters thing where everyone was drawing Devil's Tower. Everybody drew the same, every, everybody drew the same thing, which was the same it's, model. It's is, intuitive, isn't it? If you don't, it, it is just like, if, if you hadn't thought about um a lot of stuff you would probably assume you know, yeah. like it's, it's kind yeah of why why wouldn't you i mean the yeah. if you watch if it, watch have you want to have some fun watch some time-lapse photography of stars uh you know whether when they're going across the sky right and that is the question is are the stars moving or are we moving you know we say the stars are moving and science will say no 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 it's us it's us it's not the stars I'm like really okay so why isn't there any parallax and last but not least, so I got it. I'm just looking at stuff. I have so much content I could throw you, which is the reason you want, you want motivation. One of the reasons why we do this, this guy right here. And that statement that he made, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the good thing about science is this true, whether or not you believe in it. One of the most arrogant things I've ever heard in my life next to probably anything Kanye has ever said. Is, is Neil Tyson. He's just, oh, he's the bane of our freaking existence. I, sh I should be jumping off. Um, but okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really nice to meet you. And uh, and yeah, I will probably, I will almost certainly send you an email saying what I've forgotten, but thank you for your time and please help. And I will keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. If you need anything else, let me know. Cheers. Good thank to you. talk to you. Thanks, Mark. All right, bye-bye.